Thanks everyone for joining for today's Pangeo Showcase. It's my pleasure to introduce Shane Ellipot, who is a research associate professor at the Department of Ocean Sciences at the Rosenstiel School at the University of Miami. Uh, Shane conducts research in physical oceanography, focusing on atmosphere ocean interactions, ocean surface, boundary layer dynamics, meridional overturning circulation dynamics and the general oceanic circulation. And a few weeks ago, Shane posted a really exciting uh, Pangeo post on his really tremendous feat in providing a cloud uh, cloud optimized analysis ready data set, uh, integrating both HICON uh, Eulerian data sets as well as some Lagrangian uh, particle trajectories. And so I'm really excited that Shane's here as our invited speaker and I'll pass it over to you, Shane, thanks. All right, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, all right, I'm sharing my screen. Let's see, I'm gonna go in play mode, hide this. All right, am I in full screen? Yep, we can see it in full screen. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, so ICOM Ocean Track, that's the name of the data set uh, that we just recently published. Uh, so as uh, Max said, my name is Chanel Ipo, I'm at the University of Miami. And uh, I wanna thank uh, many collaborators uh, that were directly involved in this data set and the science associated with it. Uh, that include uh, Ed Zaron, Eli Fegler, Brian Arbig, Jay Shriver, Philip Neron, Milan Kerchik, and Kevin Santana. Um, so I could, there's a lot of things I could talk to you about. Um, so I'm gonna try to focus maybe on like the history and the problems that I had generated in this data set and um, the obstacles that I faced and that we all faced together. Uh, so maybe that uh, would be material for discussion or, or for the question later. Um, so what is uh, this data set? Um, it's called ICOM Ocean Track. It's about six terabytes of data that are currently being held in a um, AWS F3 bucket. And it has a DOI associated with uh, Zenodo Archive, which is given here on the slide. Um, in order to describe this data set in details, uh, we have written a data descriptor paper that was published in the journal Scientific Data, which is called an integrated data set of near surface Eulerian fields and Lagrangian trajectories from an ocean model. Um, it is interesting that um, the editor suggested that I do not use the name of the data set in the title of the paper and wanted more of a descriptor title rather than a name that might not um, you know, appeal or mean anything to people. I thought that was interesting. Um, associated with this paper and with data set is a GitHub repository that holds some of the codes, example of the code that was used to generate the data set, um, as well as some notebook examples in Python on how to get started and analyze this data set. On the right is an, an animation that you can generate yourself using some of the examples on the GitHub repository that shows the trajectories of um, particles released in an ocean model, uh, which is part of this data set. Uh, it shows the motion of these particles for about 60 days. And the particles are colored by their longitude at uh, time step 30, at, 30 day, at the 30 day mark. Uh, so let's give you one example of the richness and the content of this data set. Um, so the details that maybe have mattered to the oceanographers. So we have ocean velocity at the surface, the meter, and at 15 meter depth. We have the sea surface height that has two components, a steric component that is due to changes in density on the, in the ocean, and a non-steric component that is due to local changes of mass. Um, all of these variables are given at early time steps for one year integration of the HICOM model that was forced by free early atmospheric forcing, realistic forcing from the year 2014. And this uh, ocean model is what we can call a state of the art simulation of the ocean, as it simulates not only the oceanic general circulation, but as well as the tides, the barotropic and the internal tides that are important for the overall um, energetics of the ocean. So the data set is separated in two parts or rather has two components. It has a Eulerian component, uh, which is which uh, constitute the, the, the core in terms of size of the data set, which is about 5.6 terabytes as it is right now. 
Um, it has 12 ZAR stores for the velocity variables, and it is constituted of 12 ZAR stores for the CISPRS height variables. And there is one ZAR store, one ZAR file that contains the bathymetry information of the model. Associated with the Eulerian dataset, we have conducted uh, Lagrangian particle seeding experiments, and we have about 13 million particle trajectories as part of this dataset that amounts to about half a terabyte of data. We have 11 ZAR stores for the particles at the surface at zero meter, and we have 11 ZAR stores for particles at 15 meter depth. And the trajectories of the particle uh, are 60 day longs, and we were able to uh, do 11 release experiments one month apart. So two months release experiment overlapping by one month in this model. And as the particles um, uh, are being advected in the uh, velocity field of the model, they, of course, um, collect their latitude and longitude. There, we've calculated the velocity of the particles, and they've also sampled the sea surface height along their trajectory. And we have also devised a grounding flag, which is an indication of where the particles potentially have reached the coach, the coast and have beached or grounded themselves. So in the tutorials, in the GitHub repository associated with this, uh, we provide you a number of examples of what you can do. Uh, some Eulerian analysis that is analyzing the flow in a fixed time, in fixed space. So at the top, you can see how you can plot how the longitude and the latitude of that model is organized. Uh, on the left-hand side at the bottom, you see an extraction of a time series of Eulerian velocity and c surface height. On the right-hand side at the bottom, you see an example of conducting a spectral analysis of a velocity time series and an SSH time series. So the important thing of this um, data set for the Eulerian component is that we provide uh, the model in the near original uh, grid. It's an X, Y grid where the latitude and the longitude are not regular in space, as you can see on the plot of latitude and longitude, which is one of the um, uh, challenges associated with analyzing this data set. Another example that I already showed you, um, the particles are advected in the velocity field. So these are two examples of uh, the type of analysis and representation you can do uh, with the Jupyter notebooks provided in the GitHub repository. Uh, another thing that you can do as an example, you can focus on a given region and you can calculate the kinetic energy of the flow from a Eulerian standpoint on the left or from a Lagrangian standpoint on the right, as an example here in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so why did we create this data set? So we were driven by a number of scientific questions. And so this data set was supported throughout a number of grants. So we had an NSF funded project from 2019 to 2024 with Ed Zaron to quantify and study oceanic internal data tides using mostly ocean surface drifters. So we wanted to use the model and the synthetic trajectories to test the ability of real ocean surface drifters to measure the tides. So this, that was one of the scientific questions. Um, we had, I had also another project, a data generation project for one year funded by my university to study the feasibility of measuring mean sea level with GPS equipped surface buoys. So once again, we had synthetic particles in the model that were sampling the sea surface height along their trajectories that allowed us to test the type of signal one would obtain from surface drifters. So as an example, the scientific question was how much noise from internal tides in sea level signal from surface Lagrangian drifters would we obtain? And then currently we have an ongoing NSF also funded project with Spencer Jones and Drew Bavlada, which is about quantifying and study sub-mesoscale motions also from a Lagrangian point of view. Using real drifters in the ocean uh, requires to understand better how, um, you know, the potential biases and methods that need to be used to estimate quantities in the ocean from real drifters. So once again, this data set becomes handy um, when it comes to understanding the nature of Lagrangian observations compared to earlier observations. Another thing that we do as an example is that an example of an analysis that was conducted by an undergraduate student of mine at the University of Miami is to quantify the amount of kinetic energy in the tidal band. So at the top left, as an example, this is what you obtain from an Eulerian point of view. And on the top right, this is what you would obtain from a Lagrangian point of view. And if you want to compare the two at the bottom left, you see a map that shows you a ratio statistic of the two energy estimated either from an Eulerian or a Lagrangian point of view. And the fact that you have a lot of blue 
on this map is telling us that if you estimate the tides from the drifters, you have potentially up to 30% underestimation from the drifters. And if you look on the top right, you see the kinetic energy. On the bottom right, you see the kinetic energy of the low frequency component of the flow. And you can see how this is associated with the bias pattern that you see on the left. I'm going a little bit quick. We're writing a paper about this, but this is the type of work we've been able to do with the data set. So, um, as I said, uh, another graduate student uh, did a thesis during his last year where he compared Eulerian and Lagrangian approaches to estimated kinetic energy in the ocean. We are writing a paper about this. And there is actually another similar study that was published very recently where they used another state-of-the-art model, the MIT-GCM, where they also released particles in the model and they conducted the same type of analysis. I just have to say that the particles from their experiment are not viable. And MIT-GCM is available um, in different, uh, in different uh, regions, in different parts. Uh, but we are very proud to bring together this data set where everybody can repeat the same analysis that we've been doing hopefully in a, in a straightforward way. So how did we create this data set? This is maybe the story that I want to tell really today. Um, so how did it start? It was very exciting. Um, I got this project. It was my first time that I was going to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm considering myself to be an observationalist. So it was my first time that I was going to analyze a big data set. So high resolution ocean model outputs, I was very excited about it. So the model was run by uh, Jay Shriver at the US Naval uh, Research Laboratory and with Brian Arbeck from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, we decided to analyze it for its um, you know, tide component, I want to say. So, uh, well, so the data set was available as um, 8,759 net CDS files for the velocity and about the same number of files for the CISOFA side of the model and then one file for the bathymetry. So the, each of the individual NetCDF files were early snapshot on the globe of the UNV velocity component at the surface at 50 meter depth and at the bottom of the model. So each uh, NetCDF file is two gigabyte. So the totality of the velocity file was about 16.25 terabyte, terabyte of data. And out of this, you know, 16.25 terabyte of data, each NetCDF file was repeating latitude and longitude in it. So about two eighths of the data were superfluous in the data set. For the sea surface height, uh, we had 8,759 NetCDF files of, of sea surface height, but we had the total, the steric, and the non-steric, as well as the latitude and the longitude again. So total equals steric plus non-steric. So we basically had three fifths of the data that were superfluous in those data sets. And the total net CDF file for the CISFOS height was about 10 terabytes. And all these variables were given on a 9,000 by 7,055 XY grid, not regular in longitude and latitude. And so how I did obtain those data, well, I downloaded them locally on my supercomputer from the University of Michigan using an R-Sync SCP type of transfer. It took several days, of course. All these individual net CDF files are currently available for download only. Uh, from Globus, which is a research cyber infrastructure developed and operated as a non-for-profit by the University of Chicago. So you can find this data. Um, the collection name is non assimil HICOM 125th SSH and surface velocities. It does not have a DOI. You have to request a login, uh, and then it has a web interface to download. And so this is really an example of a data set which is a viable but I believe is not accessible, which is um, something I've heard my colleague Shell Genteman uh, tell us many times, but yes, you can have a, a viable data set, but it's not really accessible. What do you do with 28 terabytes of data if you want to analyze it yourself locally or even anywhere? Um, so it started very extensively. So I had to budget to uh, get all this data and analyze them on my own supercomputer at the University of Miami. And so I basically was quoted about $40,000 to be able to have this data and process this data on the supercomputer at UM for an original three-year uh, time span of the project. So I got the money from NSF, I paid for all of it, and then I got my 40 terabytes of space and bunch of nodes to analyze the data. Um, so now we've moved to a new supercomputer and the cost for me of about having 40 terabyte of fast storage is about uh, $2,000 per year. And then the compute and the scratch space to analyze those data and deal with this data is um, you know, charged as needed. Uh, so it has got a little bit better, but you know, we started very expensive. 
So how do I analyze all this data? Uh, and so I was very interested in time series analysis. So I wanted to analyze the data across the time dimension, which, mean, which meant that I had to basically analyze the data across the 8,000 NetCDF files. Um, so I was not exactly sure on how to do that. I could have done that with MATLAB. I was trained, uh, you know, all my career I've used MATLAB and I decided that for this project, I was going to use Python. I was excited about the Pangeo tools and I wanted to apply this to uh, my supercomputing environment. So we didn't have any Jupyter Lab on the original supercomputer. So I had to install it myself and I tried the Pangeo tools, XRA, Dask and all of that. And at the bottom line, using XRA open MF dataset with 8,759 files does not work, or at least it does not work for me. So, and I had no understanding of what computer nodes were, the core, the threads, everybody was using different words. I didn't understand what it meant. I didn't really have a tech support. You know, I had a tech support, but I would go to them and say, hey, why is Dask not working for me? And they had no idea what I was talking about. So it was just really a little bit of a nightmare and I was going nowhere for months. Um, so the next thing that I did is that I turned myself to Pangeo and I posted, uh, you know, on Pangeo Discourse and I say, hey, here's my problem. What is the best practice to go from thousands of NetCDF files to analyze on the HPC cluster? And to this day, I think this is a post that has had like the most views on Pangeo with about, um, you know, nearly 16,000 um, views and a, a lot of replies. Um, so it created a lot of activities, a lot of questions that was very exciting and um, Thankfully, uh, Ryan Abernathy, who is online right now, decided that he wanted to help me out. So I believed he created from this um, question the Rechunker Python package. And about you know two months later, that basically allowed that allows currently people to actually change the structural um, you know format of your data in order to change the path dimension along which you would what you would rather analyze your data set. Basically change the check structure of the data as you might understand it in the way that um, our data sets are stored into ZAR arrays or uh, analyzed with XRA. So, so it got better for a while. So we worked with a computer science uh, undergraduate from the University of Michigan, uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We used the Rechunker, thank you very much, to convert the NetCDF files into ZAR archives that now were chunked along the time dimension. And all of this was done on the supercomputer at the University of Michigan. It all went very well. We moved forward. We did some analysis of the data, but then uh, the uh, undergraduate student did graduate, didn't leave enough notes, and then stopped responding to our emails. Um, so we couldn't replicate his studies. We couldn't redo the things we needed to do to actually publish the paper. Um, so that didn't go well for a while. And then Brian Arbeck basically redid all the analysis in MATLAB in his supercomputer at the University of Michigan doing lots of loops. So the use of the return curve was like lost in that battle. Um, but nevertheless, we published the paper where we basically analyzed MIT GCM, ICOM, and the real drifters. Um, in order to compare estimates of kinetic energy from these different sources. Well, it actually got better. So I was able, I wanted to do more work with the data. I went back to my own supercomputer. I got some more fundings. And one of the things that I did is that I generated the Lagrangian particles in the model. So I used the software Ocean Parcels that some of you may know. I want to thank Eric Van Sebele and his collaborators that helped me a lot to actually being able to do these seeding experiments, especially because the grid of the HICOM model that I was using was different from any other grid that was being used before by Ocean Parcels. So here I was able to, I couldn't use the ZAR archives, but I used the NetCDF files to vector the particles in the velocity of the models, but I saved all the output as ZAR archives for the Lagrangian component. Then I decided to put these things together. I decided to optimize my space. So now I created myself the ZAR archives for the early and velocity fields and the Sisyphus height data. However, then I tried to do more seeding experiments, but as of right now, the Ocean Parcel software does not allow to take a ZAR archive as an input to generate a field set of velocity that is being used for advecting particles. So um, I actually put a, uh, a, a pull request or like a, a, an issue, I raised an issue on GitHub because it would be very nice if we could actually use the archive with Ocean Parcel. 
Anyway, so and then um, my undergraduate used the czar archives of Lagrangian data and of Valerian data to conduct all this analysis of comparison of uh, kinetic energy from the drifters in the model and from the Eulerian fields in the model. And we're writing a paper about it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it's been you know, working very hard. And now on my supercomputer, even using Jupyter Hub environment, we can do, let's say, you know, some exploratory work in a matter that you know it took me a year to do before. So we're very happy about having made all that progress. So now at the end, so I was faced with a question, how do coming to the end of these grants, right? How do I archive, preserve, and share those, you know, uh, analyze ready cloud optimized or R Eulerian and Lagrangian data? So I could keep um, the NetCDF files uh, in a cost-effective storage at my university for about um, $600 per year. That's what I'm doing right now, just to be sure. But then I have these six terabytes of ZAR archives. So if I want to keep them on my supercomputer, uh, that costs about $50 per terabyte per year, $300 per year. I could do it for a few years, uh, but I cannot share this because it's like, you know, in the silo of my supercomputer. Um, I asked my university library, no, sorry, this is way too large. We cannot, you know, on our repository, we cannot keep that. And then the librarian told me, you know, it's probably not a good best practice to keep a model output in a permanent repository. You should just save the code and tell people to rerun the model. And, you know, that doesn't happen. It's not possible to do that most of the time. So Zenodo or Figshare also have, you know, limits, uh, which, you know, standard limits are 50 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes. So six terabytes was not going to cut it. Um, and then out of the blue, I actually got a, an email from uh, South Florida AWS representatives who were basically working with local universities in South Florida and wanted to meet with me. And so they actually came to my office, two of them, and we sat down and I explained to them my issue and what, what, I, what I wanted to do. I wanted to basically to preserve this data set. Um, so one of the things that I learned from them and I had a lot of help from them is that I was able to set up my own AWS S3 bucket and I uploaded all the data there. And then I wanted to pay for it. And I had about $4,000 left on one of my grants. And I would say, cool. Um, I can just pay in advance for it. It costs about $100 a month uh, to have those data on the AWS S3 bucket. And then um, I can pay for it maybe for four years, I can have it up. So it's bit, it was impossible. Uh, my university wouldn't want me to prepay $4,000 for the service that was not guaranteed to exist for the time that I was paying for it. Okay. And then setting up a billing with AWS was also impossible because prepaying with AWS requires to use a credit card. And my university doesn't want me to use a personal credit card. And so it was pretty much impossible for me to pay in advance and just give those $4,000. I was going to have to give back to my university was $4,000. I was just like, wait a minute. The project was to generate the data. I want to pay for it. And then it's going to be up and then people are going to use it. So that was impossible. That was a nightmare. It led to nothing. And I was just paying $100 per month just to have those data sitting. And then it was going to disappear because I was not going to be able to pay for it anymore. At the same time, thankfully, uh, AWS has an open data program with quarterly review where people can submit an application to host their data set for free. So I applied in October 2023 and was accepted in January 2024. So uh, thankfully, so I had to close my own AWS S3 bucket. I had to work with the one that they opened for me. I had to upload again all the data. And now they're hosting them for two years free of charge. And then after two years, they're going to reevaluate and look at the use of the data and see if it's actually being used. So please use the data because hopefully maybe they're going to continue paying for it. And then I submitted and I published a data descriptor paper in scientific data. And so the thing is, is that that journal right, wanted a DOI for the data set. At time of submission, they wanted me to have the data set into a repository that would mint a DOI. Problem is that AWS does not mint a DOI. And I believe it makes sense because AWS wouldn't do that because then if they did, they would, I guess, guarantee to host the data set at perpetuity. And so I guess that's why they don't do it. So the trick to do it is that was given to me by the editor of the journal is to actually have a Zernodo archive that would contain only a URL link to the AWS, um, you know, repository AWS S3 bucket. So that's how we did it. 
it's a bit of a dirty secret here because you know in two years from now if aws decide to pull the plug then this data set is not accessible to anyone anymore even if we have the data the paper that says that the data is available it, it wouldn't anymore actually so hopefully in two years we'll find a solution to keep hosting it on aws or maybe they will decide to host it so what's the future for this data set so I continue to use it. I have a project to look at submesoscale with two great collaborators. And I have some, you know, Monique from other grants, so I keep using it. But right now, I don't analyze the version which is in the cloud. I need to have my local version on my supercomputer to analyze it. So that's the first disclaimer. So I would love to see it analyzed by anyone in the cloud. How do you actually do that? Um, I'm not entirely sure. So you can actually go onto the websites of the uh, AWS S3 buckets. And then there are some hyperlinks to some notebooks that I wrote for the purpose of that uh, data set. And it opens a um, Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab, which is a notebook computing environment that allows you to actually run the notebooks and do the analysis of that data set from the cloud. So you can get a free account, but it's limited in time and in terms of resources. Um, but technically right now, how do I write my next proposal to propose to actually analyze it in the cloud? Would it be through Amazon made AWS? I don't exactly know. I'm thinking about this and I would love to hear your comments about this. And then the analysis of this like random data should be also facilitated by Cloud Drift. So I had another uh, NSF EarthQ program funded project, which is focusing on uh, devising methods to analyze Lagrangian data. And so with this data set now in the cloud, we're hoping to optimize this um, library to actually use very large data set in the cloud. Um, all right, so this is a story that I wanted to tell you today. Uh, maybe I went a little bit fast, but I wanted to give you some material maybe for questions and discussion. Thank you very much.